So today we're going to talk about mental health and athletes. So basically the month of May is mental health awareness. And I've been doing a different topic every week. And this has been the most popular one so far as sports is a big thing of American culture. Uh, I think everyone in the chat and everyone who's on the panel is either a current or former athlete. So this is going to be some good stuff for you guys to take with. And if you're a coach, this is something you could do with your clients or your uh, athletes, or if you're a parent, same thing. So I feel there should be some takeaways and then I'm gonna come obviously from professional experiences. My background is in psychology, but we'll have some actual people who've performed at the highest of levels who can give their two cents too. So as I always start these, these uh, webinars, I always go over disclaimer. So I'll quickly read that. This webinar is not intended to be medical advice or diagnosing these psychological disorders. If you need any kind of mental health treatment, please see a licensed practitioner. And I always do that to cover my bases because what we're gonna share is gonna be more so how to understand how being an athlete and how mental health and mental performance is affected more so than a diagnosis. So that's why I put this disclaimer here. All right, hold up, Rashard, let me promote you to panelists as well. So we got JK here, we got Rashard and Phil will be joining at some point. But basically, like I said, we're gonna go through it and they're gonna have Q and A for them at the end. So you can answer questions that they feel about their own uh, life experiences and we'll get it underway. All right, so let me quickly go through our special guests. Uh, the beauty of this is I didn't have to do a lot of research on them because I know all of them personally. So start with Phil DeRue. He's a world-renowned strength coach and he's a former pro fighter himself. He's worked with uh, clients such as Dustin Poirier, uh, some of the UFC's best fighters, some football players in the NFL, as well as celebrities such as Kevin James and Timberland. So he definitely brings a good side as an athlete, but he does have a good side as a coach as well. Uh, Rashard Matthews, former NFL seven-year vet, played with the Dolphins and the Titans, was their leading receiver. Uh, he's definitely been through a lot. He has a great story, so he can give some insight on what he's been through. And then last, definitely not least, is Jeremy Kellum. And I know it says motivational speaker and former arena champ and DB of the year, but he's so much more. He owns a business called We Impact Now. So he does a lot of work on helping people, not just athletes, get better at taking advantage of life. That means from the physical, emotional, spiritual, he does it all. So these are our guests and the format of this webinar, I'm gonna be going over different uh, concepts through mental performance and mental health with athletes, but throughout JK, Richard, feel free to stop me and add to it. Cause I'm gonna give obviously the, the deeper science and understanding, but y'all feel free to put your two cents in from your own experience and at the end we'll have a Q and A. All right, so with that being said, let's get into it. All right, so usually I start these things off so we can all be on the same page. Some quick definitions. I'm not gonna go through them super deep, but basically what are we trying to do as athletes? We wanna stay physically ready, of course, but also mentally ready. So I like to go over these topics of health. It's the obvious answer, but I'm gonna go over it anyway. Absence of injury or disease. If you're an athlete, if you're a coach, your first thing should be is keeping yourself healthy or keeping your athletes healthy from a physical standpoint. Because if they're hurt physically, they can't do nothing for you. Wellness, that's more so, okay, how do I keep them doing this? It's proper stretching, proper diet, uh, proper um, mindset management, things that's going to keep them good, behaviors, habits. So that's why wellness is important because that's what you do to continue being healthy. Now, mental health, I'm just going to give you an overview. I'm not going to even read those. We want to make sure that your well-being as you pertain to how you handle emotions, how you handle stress, pressures, and definitely being an athlete, you see a lot of those. So having good mental health doesn't just mean you never have a problem. It just means that you're able to have healthier behaviors to facilitate growth. All right. So the first part I like to talk about this is athletic identity. So I feel, Shar JK, uh, you guys should definitely have a lot to say about this, but I'll go over what that actually means. And every athlete can relate to this term. So what this just means is, how do I identify as an athlete? Now, this means this is everything to me. Is this just a part of my life until I get to college and I'm going to go a separate way? Or is this going to be, if this doesn't work, I'm done. So that those questions may pertain differently to different people, but that's why you got to ask, who are you as an athlete? Also, I like to look at how does that affect you as a person? Because if you lose a game, if you have a bad practice or a bad track meet or swim meet, whatever, do you become defeated in the actual life? Because a lot of people tie their worth and value to the sport. Granted, being an athlete is who you are. We're not denying that. And it can take you very far. As you see the panelists on here, it's taking them very far. But you got to ask yourself, all because I had a bad game doesn't mean I, I'm just a failure at life because you're an individual first. Obviously, athlete is what we are, but we definitely have different traits. I like to also talk about friends 
teammates. There's a difference. Now I can say personally, I had teammates that were like my best friends. Two of them are on this, this uh, webinar. So I can understand that, but you kind of have to have a circle outside of that because it's not saying that these have to be your main go-to people, but it's healthy to have that relationship and that boundary when you're not just in the sport and finding balance. So do you have hobbies outside of this? Are, are you just practice, practice, practice? Don't get me wrong. As JK, as Phil, we all were practice guys. We would do extra after practice, but we found time to hang out. We found time to have hobbies. I used to be a rapper. Don't laugh at me. But yeah, these are just things we got to understand. An athlete is who we are, but how much is it? Studies show that someone who's high in athletic identity, this means they're going to be a higher performer. But if you're too high, that means you're so ingrained into your sport that everything else is kind of falling by the wayside. So I'll ask my two panelists, uh, who want to go first? Uh, Rashar, you look like you're thinking. So can you tell us, like, how do you uh, identify as an athlete and how did that shape you as a person? Um, yeah, man, first and foremost, appreciate you having me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, shout out to yourself. Keep doing good work. Um, how do I identify as an athlete? That's That's tough. That's a good question. I probably would say that I was the type that, you know, everything, nothing else mattered, man. Um, I was worried about performing. I was affected by bad performance. Uh, so I, I was all in, you know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, I knew it was at stake and I was all in, man. Um, so I guess I was, I don't know how to, you know, I don't know how to really properly answer that. I guess um, I was just, program to you know what i'm saying um be 110 percent you know um involved with what i was doing to make it you know that's that's that was my main focus so i felt like uh going back now i probably would have done it a little differently as far as you know like you said give more time to uh hang out do quote unquote normal things instead of just focus on you know, football, 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 no matter what, you know, even having a family, it still was football, football, football. Um, now I got to go back into being a father and all those things and stuff like that, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's how I guess I will an answer that question. Yeah, there's no wrong answer. That's good because, like, if that's what you identify, that's not a bad thing because, like I said, that makes you a better athlete. So that's mm -hmm. what gets you further. And that's why I want the people, if there's any coaches or kids at home watching, just understand – you need that edge. You, you gotta be invested. So there's nothing wrong with that answer at all. That's who you are, uh, J.K. I know I witnessed it myself, but what do you think on this? See you there, J.K. Chilling. <laughs> Yeah, uh, take the mute. I put it on or off. Mm -hmm. There, JK. Trying to. Well, now he'll jump back in. That's all good. So stress, so this doesn't even have to be said. Being an athlete entails long hour practice, games, studying for the game, going home, thinking about the game. Like you get no really outlet when it comes to that. And if you're talking about student athlete, which is the majority of athletes around the world are student athletes. Obviously we got pros, but that's a small few that get to make it to that level. But most are dealing with school, they're dealing with parents, dating. So it's something you can't get rid of. So that's why I always tell people, the healthiest thing to do with stress is to identify what are the stressors, first and foremost. Because once you understand what it is, because a lot of times we like to project, like if anyone in Rashad or Jake, if you chime in, had a practice or a game where some outside was getting to you in the game and had nothing to do with it. And this distraction can obviously hurt performance, but also it's unhealthy because now we're channeling the wrong things to the wrong places. So that's why I always say the first thing is you got to find out what the underlying issue is and not just find out address it because some people know what's bothering them but never address it whether it be a coach whether it be a significant other a friend family fans whatever so we got to understand what it is bothering us and then address it now once you address it locate your control in that so this is important because if i know it's what I'm oh, sorry 
Webin? It's tough because, you know, when you say that, the biggest thing is, too, is, is not being afraid to address it. You know, um, I think that we all have issues, you know, but in the athlete world, you're, you're taught to ignore it so much just because the only thing that matters is your performance. You know, nobody cares if you're, you know, even, as, you know, I just give an example, you know, not an example, but, you know, uh, hypothetical, you know what I'm saying? Nobody cares if the kids are sick or if, uh, you know, if, if you have issues, relationship issues or issues with whatever, you know, whatever's going on, you know, when, when it's time to catch that ball, you better catch that ball. You know, you drop it, nobody cares, you know? So I think uh, as athletes, we're so taught to um, ignore our issues because the only thing that matters is performance. performance. And I think on every stage of, of um, you know, uh, of, the athlete, of, of the athletic world, as far as uh, middle school, high school, even coaches, like, you know, they, we're taught to ignore our personal life. And, and um, you know, I think that, you know, more people need to be able to uh, let athletes know that it's okay that, you know, uh, it's still okay to have problems. It's okay to open up about the problems you have because your teammate right next, you know, the next lock, then uh, your locker mate might have the same issues as you, but most of the time they, 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 you know, we get so warped into being afraid to tell people what's going on that, you know, so, you know, I didn't mean to cut you off, but the biggest thing is like being not, not being afraid to open up and talk about that. That's the biggest thing. My bad. Well, yeah. So do you think there is out? Cause I know I, I obviously I didn't play it at the level of you or JK or Phil, but it's like, mm -hmm. I understand, like, do you think if you do address it, they, especially at your level, you guys at the pro level, you say you're just a number to them. So do you feel like do people like from what you've seen or personal experience, do people address it in any kind of way? Cause obviously going to the coach ain't going to help. I know that. So what do you think they use? Yeah. Healthy or unhealthy? Some, I know people. I mean, they try, you know, uh, I know, especially like with, with the league, they, they, um, they try to, you know, set up things and, and certain, and certain things like that. But I think that you get so caught up on, you know, cause you know, a lot of us come from nothing. You get so caught up on, like I said, you know, the, the biggest thing is performance. If you can't perform, then next guy up, you know what I'm saying? So the biggest thing is, you know, our, our schedule is from 6 a.m. And, and, you know, as every day, everybody has to work. And, you know, that's not an excuse. But we get so caught up in uh, the physical performance and the mental performance that it's hard to it's hard to, um, I guess, dive into the real issues, man. I mean, even, you know, just uh, talking about it is hard, you know, because like I said, you know, people ain't trying to hear that, you know, uh, as as bad as it sounds, but people ain't trying to hear that. They, you know, it's me being a receiver. They trying to have me go run routes and catch this football. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and it's good and it's bad, but I think, like I said, man, I just think that more people have to be willing to open up, you know, um, even going through things now after football, you know, talking with people, uh, opening up is the biggest part, man. Um, it's kind of like being addicted to something. The first part of addiction is, is, um, uh, is admitting it. You know, and that's the hardest part. So uh, if you can't admit it or open up to something, then, you know, and I think a lot of us are too uh, too afraid to open up and talk about the real realness of, uh, you know, our, our issues that we have going on every day. All right. That was that was very insightful. Brother Kellum. What up, bro? My bad, man. I had some come up, so I was trying to take care of it, man. So my bad, man. I apologize, though. You still at the beginning. You ain't missed nothing. Uh, so yeah, basically we're just talking about, Rashad just shared about how dealing with stress, like both of y'all played at the elite level football, you were on the other side of the ball, he was a receiver, you're a DB, but he was saying how like, how do you deal with it? Because as you know, I know, we all know, you're a body to them. So it's hard yeah. to be like, hey coach, this will happen in my outside life. So he was sharing like how people might cope with that or you personally might cope with it, or have you seen it happen? Uh, no, nah, definitely. Um, I know for me personally, I think my stress uh, came from wanting to make it to the league and always feeling like I had to stay ready. Um, and so it literally, I mean, you know, training with you, it was never an off season. Um, and that's the thing, you know, with playing arena or just playing in another league outside of the NFL and you trying to get to the league, you never could rest. Um, so it was from March, all the way to August, I'm playing in the 18, 21 game season. And then when August hits, now you kind of getting like, okay, camp's about to start. Well, July camp's going to start X, Y, Z. So he's trying to stay ready. All, you know what I'm saying? Never knowing when you're going to get the call. 
Um, and so that was stressful because it was like, man, when do I take a vacation? When do I just relax? When do I chill? And, and that was a part of like me even planning, you know what I'm saying? What, when we got married, like after so many years of being in the arena, you know, after like the fourth, fifth year, I was like, look, we're going to plan it during the NFL season. I didn't wait it this long. I'm not going to just put my life on hold. So that it was, it was stressful, man, just because, you, you know, you want to be ready, want to be ready for the opportunity, but you're not knowing when it was going to come. Um, and so, you know, it was just a lot of stress in that sense. Um, but, you know, I think just overall, I know my, my spiritual relationship with God, you know, definitely helped out. And then I think just having people in your life, like my wife and, and, and people in your life that understand and kind of understand your journey that you can vent to um, and that you can speak to um, allows you to kind of have a different perspective of, of what you may be experiencing, what you may be going through. But, uh, but I think definitely, man, just being a professional athlete and, and just the, those different stressors that you have, uh, going on and not people I remember somebody told me um they was like you want to go to the NFL right I was like yes it was like well why you don't you just pray about it I was like I have been doing that it's not that simple you know and so so to the outside world it's like you think you could just snap your fingers but they don't realize what goes into it um and the mental strain it, it has on you well, I guess I'm biased because I was right there when a lot of not right there but I seen a lot of this firsthand when yeah. with um world class training out there every day I don't know if you remember when Dion was out there. I told you about what he said. Yes, yeah, so, I remember right the folks in the car. Oh, yeah. world heard it first. Dion Sanders, aka Prime Time, watching boy Jeremy Kellum. Now, like I said, I'm biased. I know him since freshman year of high school. He was one of the all state in Florida. If no offense, Rashard, but Florida, <laughs> Florida. I don't know. Cali got it. Hey, going y'all know too. Cali got the best football, man. Oh man. Uh. <laughs> we, we won't, hey, hey, one? nah, man. You, hey, you see why hey, I live out here now? You see how I'm here, huh? Yeah, my, yeah. My kids, my kids are growing. My kids are, are growing up here. We gotcha. ain't, we ain't changing that. <laughs> That's real. So I want to share this story because it just goes into where he talks about stress. So he said that people are like why why aren't you in the NFL? Like he's not trying. Like he's not waking up. He me and him would go to a park right down the street from my facility at 5 a.m. in the morning for him. Another guy named Kieran Jones who also plays played arena I think he's back in now and they would come out there with me at 5 30 in the morning before the sun come up right and he's doing everything he can and then one day we're out at a, a practice with a camp called world class speed Patrick Peterson dad owns and Deion Sanders himself was watching my boy JK ball locking down every receiver and this was around the time like I think Tyron was out there who else yeah, honey you know, was out there. a lot of a lot of big names that some still playing so yeah. he's locking them down and I, I'm standing next to it was Deion Sanders Chris Carter and I think Phil Sims, I want to say. And I'm standing next to them, hearing them talk. And, and Primetime said, that boy could ball, pointed at JK. So imagine when I told him that. He was excited. I remember your face. But yeah. imagine hearing that, knowing you putting in that work, but yeah. that call wasn't coming. That's a lot to do with, you know? And Rashard can identify that. He was a seven-round pick. So it's like, people don't, y'all both have interesting stories of how you weren't expected to do the most, but you, you proved otherwise. And that, that takes heart that, like, if any kids see this, that's something you got to remember, too, if you want to get to their level. It ain't just going to practice every day. It's staying in it when that call ain't coming or that that reward ain't received, you know, because it's a thankless job. Yeah. The biggest thing is, man, I mean, believing in self. You got to have belief in yourself. You got to have a strong belief. I mean, you're going to have people tell you, give it up. You're going to have people tell you, hey, man, why don't you focus on this? Why don't you do this? You know, and and. Sometimes you get to that point where you're, you know, because I, I take the JUCO route and sometimes it's like, man, hey, you know, I might have to. But, you know, if, if you did, then, you know, uh, the possibilities of, of, you know, of what can happen won't happen for sure. You know, and uh, that's the biggest thing, man. You got to have belief in yourself in this game in life in general. Whatever you want to chase, man, you got to be able to look yourself in the mirror every day and go after it, you know, Um and just just ignore all the doubters and, and like you know like I say you gotta have a strong belief in yourself no matter what. And, but it's like it's like you said earlier, you know you gotta have also a strong uh, belief system around you. You know people to to keep you up no matter what. Because if you ain't got that and you, and you just by yourself, it's hard. And mo- a lot of us athletes are, but none of us, you know, like I said, a lot of us won't won't um won't won't admit it because you know we're taught to be tough and prideful and all this stuff and. You know, it's like I said earlier, we all got issues, man. We all got everyday personal life going on, you know, and it's not easy. It's not easy to make it in anything. But if you believe in yourself, then, you know, the, the chances are that much greater. 
Yeah. Well, we got um, the great Phil Drew just chimed in. Um, Phil, we uh, talking about stressing. JK and Rashad just showed as an athlete, but you being a top coach, like I told everyone, you're work with Kevin James, Timberland, Dustin, the whole nine. So from a coach's perspective, I guess I'll ask you, how do you get your athletes help deal with stress? Because they were talking about from the player perspective. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times you, you got to put yourself in a position on a daily basis in practice and in training. Um, that's going to help you get rid of any type of negative thoughts when it comes down to it. Um, making sure that, like I said, you're, you're working diligently in those stressful environments so that you can adapt to the change and then put yourself in those positions so that it is, it is frequent throughout time and throughout the training. Um, I work with a lot of fighters, you know, and, and at the end of the day, no matter what I do and what the skills coaches do from a technical and a physical standpoint, the mental aspect of it uh, is, is a huge factor. 90% of the fight kind of ends depending on if the, if the individual is ready and prepared to go into battle. And so a lot of times the guys will freeze up when they, when they get the cage door closed. And if they're not able to withstand that stress and the, the anxiety that is uh, drawn out of them when, when you're, you know, you're locked inside of a cage or you step into a ring and you're going, you know, man on man or woman on woman with another individual, um, you know, you have to be able to, to take on that, that particular stress. And that's why we do it inside the training room to help cope with that. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, just catch everyone up. Like I said, Phil Daru just chiming. I'm actually in his office because we just finished up with one of our fighters, Dustin Poirier, about to get another knockout on uh, Conor McGregor. But I'm just putting that out there. Yo, what's up, man? What up, <laughs> Phil? What's up, JK? Chilling, I haven't seen man. you in a long time, man. Know, How you doing? Man. You all right? Yeah, well, doing good, too. man. I see you doing great things, man. Keep up the great you work, too, bro. brother. I appreciate that, man. Thank you, Rashad. What's yeah. going on, bro? Muted. My bad. I was on mute. What's going on, man? How you doing? How you doing? Good, man. Good, dog. Good. Good to see you guys, man. Yeah, you too, man. So those who are going to watch this later, record it, y'all getting a lot of good info from some top, not just athletes, coaches, but just great men in general. So let's move on. Next topic, mental toughness. So we've all heard this term. So like I said, I'm going to give the more background and y'all can go into the more the personal side. So just like fitness or strength or any kind of athletic skill, you can train your mental toughness. Now, I always like to say, where's your comfort zone? Because everybody says step out of the comfort zone, right? But I say, why not build a new one? Meaning, I say this not saying just give up. It's more so saying find different areas where you can push yourself. Because like, say you only like to go to a certain restaurant. I'll just do this example. And you only eat there. That's only one type of food. But what if you want to try another type of food? Same thing with your mental toughness. You got to try things that you're not good at. You know, because people always say, oh, I don't want to fail. And I always tell people, it's not about failing. It's being able to fail, but say, let's keep going. Let's go. So I always ask uh, clients I work with on the psychological side, these three things. So any athletes out there, ask yourself this. Any coaches out there, ask your athletes this. How many unfamiliar new tasks have you attempted this week? Because let's say you're good at jump shots and you only work on jump shots. Guess what? You get great at jump shots, but what about your defense? What about your, your dribbling? What about passing skills? You need to work on what you're not good at as well. Get comfortable with the things that aren't your priority. Um, also ask yourself or your athletes, how many new people have you networked to converse with? And this is not necessarily you got to come up from someone. It's just about the more you expand who you meet and know, your mindset kind of changes. So vicariously, you'll learn how they think. And not saying you have to adopt everything they do, but it's more so you might hear something in passing from an athlete or a coach that you're like, I like that. Because once you see other mindsets, it gets you more flexible in how you can think. And the last one is what kind of goals did you set for yourself? Um, are they measurable, smart goals, meaning are they specific, measurable, attainable? Um, a lot of people say, I want to win. Win doesn't tell me much. I want to be the best. That doesn't tell me much. Now you say, I want to score 30 points in the game. That tells me something. I want to make three touchdown catches. That tells me something. What is the process though? So also not just set the outcome, but how do you get to that? How many routes are you running after practice? How much uh, sprints are you doing after practice? Like these things make sense and have to be done. So I'll turn it over to you guys. How do you go about either building mental toughness with yourself when you were still fighting or playing or with your coach? Because I know all of you coach as well. So you can give the athletic side or you can give the uh, the fight or the, uh, the coach side. You want to go first? Let JK go first, man. Uh, hi. Hey. Appreciate that, Phil. Hey. <laughs> hey. But nah, um, I, I think I, I try to come from both ends of it. Um, when I try to relate to him as a player, 
like coaching, um, share some of my experiences uh, because I, I think everything is about perspective. Uh, and so uh, just as far as like being mentally tough to your point uh, is just being able to recall, I might share an experience like, hey man, I remember getting scored on in a, a, a game and, um, and then I had to come back and be able to uh, fourth down, it's in the fourth quarter, last play of the game, I had to come back and make a play. So I kind of sh might share my experiences with them in that sense, how I was able to overcome it. But then I also talk about how they're feeling. Um, and I'm like, look, man, I know you got beat. I know how you are feeling. Like you scared to go back out there or you nervous to go back out there because you don't want to mess up again. So I try to get into their actual shoes and say, look, I know how you feeling. And I think like for me, when I was younger, the feelings that I felt, I didn't know if everybody around me was feeling them. So I used to think that something was wrong with me. Like, dang, why am I nervous about this game? Like this play over here, like, they, you know, you had a person that's loud in the locker room and they, they mm. talking all that trash. And I'm like looking like, I wasn't a rah-rah guy. So I'm looking like, man, am I ready for the game? Like, am I, am I? And then I go out there, you know what I'm saying? Nine times out of 10, have a good game. And I'm like, it didn't take for me to get up like that. And so I had to realize as I got older, like, look, man, everybody is different. And what I may be feeling, everybody is feeling, but it's not about what you feel. It's about having the ability to push through what you're feeling and still go out there and get the job done. So that's how I kind of try yeah. to relate to the players and, you know, share my experience, but then tap into currently their emotions or how they may be feeling about a play, about a game, about the outcome of the game and let them know, like, I know how they're feeling, but try to give them strategies to overcome it for the next time. Mm -hmm. Nice. That was good stuff. So, what about so, you, uh, Phil? So, I, I, I'll say a, a couple of things from, like, a, from a competitor standpoint, too, as well, and, and talking about understanding the gaps in your own performance, um, understanding or having self-awareness. Because first and foremost, like, if you look at it from my perspective now, um, now I'm doing a triathlon. I'm putting myself in a position of like a, what I've never been in before. We've been, you know, strength and power athletes all our lives, all of us on this call. So what was the best way that I knew that I was going to get better at something that I knew I sucked at? Well, all right, I'm going to put myself in a position where I have to compete. So with that, I, I, I put myself there so that I have no choice but to get better and to fill those gaps. That came from self-awareness. That came from me knowing that I'm not good at that particular aspect of training or whatever, whatever it is. And I'm going to get better there so that again, I'm, I'm full, I'm full circle. With that being said, with MMA guys, the same concept. A lot of times we'll look at, we'll look at the entire game plan and we'll look at, okay, what do we need to improve upon to get us better and to make sure that we're dominant inside the fight and also in our entire career. From there, we'll be working diligently on those weak points to allow us to be, again, a full-rounded or a well-rounded fighter. That goes hand-in-hand hand with life in general. A lot of times, people shy away from what they, quote-unquote, suck at, right? For me, I want to take what I feel I'm good at. I want to make sure that I maintain that, but I also need to bring up those other aspects in my life so whatever it be whether it be from a spiritual standpoint whether it be from a psychological standpoint and also building up strength and power in other aspects of my life not just in the weight room but in my business within my relationships all of that i like that and like i said i see phil training right here he'll be with an athlete and then five minutes later he's in the the squat rack like, and then he's on a bike. So like I said, I know him just as long as uh, JK and both of them, they've been on their journey. So definitely stepping out of that comfort zone. What do you got to say, Rashad? Cause I know you got a good story too. First off, shout out to you for the triathlon. Woo! <laughs> man, that's what's up. Yeah, man. Appreciate man, it. I'm having a good issue. It's hard for me just to stay in shape. God dang. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, but, uh, I mean, I was, you know, I was the type of guy that was, I was all about being like uncomfortable, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, cause first off going like seventh round and whatnot, I, I just was on a mission, man. I mean, some people get, you know, you triggered in a certain way. So I, you know, even working with young guys and I, I coached high school last year, you know, and, and telling them certain things, you know, um, but I was ready for me I, to, I've trained on playing off of each foot man if a guy was pressing me inside if a dude was doing this I knew how to broke off break off on every route 
you know, and uh, but it, it it came from just you know my uncle, you know my one my you know my uncle told me one time, you know, I went seven round. He was like, hey man, you better go in there and be ready. And I just you know being all being an underdog, it just always you know made me uh work on those type of things. But and then you get in there and you see you know you see how much work people put in, you know, like you know the guys you know on this we we put in work, you know, it's it's not an easy thing to 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 make it and then stay around. And even, I mean, Phil dealing with, you know, uh, the champ, you know what I'm saying? It's not easy to stay, you know, stay the champ and, and do things like that. It's, it's tough. And, and I knew, I knew that from a, from a young age. So, I mean, I did things like, you know, yoga, Pilates, most guys, I don't know why, but you get into this um, masculine world that dudes don't want to even try those. things. I used to tell the high school dudes like, Hey man, y'all need to go to yoga. Dude couldn't even break down and, and cut, man. I'm like, do yoga, man. They're, they're laughing, you know, and, and certain things, but that's, that's what we've, I guess, built. But um, I think it's, uh, I, I encourage, you know, athletes to be uncomfortable because if you ain't, if you're being comfortable, then something's wrong, you know, because the guys that you watch on TV or you, you, you idolize, they're, they're, uh, that's their training. I mean, you know, Phil's a top trainer and he's training, you know, like I said, a champ to, you know, I'm, I, I know for a fact he ain't making him comfortable. So, you know, you're trying to, you know, uh, in my shoes, trying to keep up with the best. You know, you're going against Richard Sherman's and certain guys like they, you know, um, so, you know, I don't know. I, I just I, I don't know why guys like to be so comfortable. I, I, you know, I, I encourage you to do that in their training and um, mentally, too. I mean, when I used to train with you, shoot, I was always trying to step it up. You know, hey, when, when it got too easy, bro, like, nah, I want to do the hard stuff. Like, this is too easy. Make it hard, you know. Mm -hmm. Um and, and just even doing things like that with you, Nick, um, I think I, I wish more athletes would tap into stuff like that just because it helped me out. It helped me zone in, you know, especially just focusing on the football and the crowd and stuff like that. It was, it was easy. But, um, you know, I encourage people to, to tap into uncomfortable situations. That's real. And I got to give a, another – I know I keep taking a shot now because – but it's like three of y'all crazy because – JK, I was working with him as a strength coach way back in the day. So that got me a lot of experience of learning – to do this and then Phil, he brought me in about four or five years ago and obviously the rest history and then you. So all three of y'all have a big like integral role in my career. So I appreciate y'all for that. But yeah, going back to everything y'all said, I'm comfortable. I don't think if anyone's watching, I don't think if you missed it, they all said that. Stepping out of that comfort and putting yourself in a predicament where you're not expected to win or excel. Not saying to fail on purpose, of course, but you gotta be able to say, will I make it? As JK said it when he's talked about himself, he doubted himself, but not in a way that he didn't think he had the ability. It's just like, hey, I'm a human being. I I'm a person. But guess what? He followed through and stepped up anyway. And that's what it's really about. We all going to have that nervousness, anxiety, but that's what lifts us up. The failures are the ones who take that anxiety and then go the opposite way and quit or let it get to them. So this is definitely something y'all y'all getting a lot. So this last uh, slide is more like a cue. And I know a few people ask questions. I guess we'll do that at the very end. I think got about 20 more minutes. But um, so I put together some like more direct questions. Uh, hold up, my screen's all over the place. So how do you keep going when the odds are against you? So I guess we kind of talked about this earlier, but I guess you can get more like a maybe specific, like, like you, like, you know, what did you do? Like whether it be mental health, whether it be just adversity. So how did you keep going despite the odds being against you? Mm -hmm. Um, Let go, Phil. <laughs> See, I like how y'all throw each other in the fire. <laughs> <laughs> so, as far as the odds being against us, as in the cards are stacked against us from the from the day of birth, I, I believe a lot of that uh, comes into play, and and all of us have gone through that. Um, I was in situations before even meeting you two gentlemen, and you know, you know. I had to deal with certain things that took me away from the path that I thought I was going to go and I had to pivot. So the goal for me is to always stay focused on the ultimate goal, but have an understanding that things aren't always going to go as planned. And so for that, I'm always able to what we call auto regulate. And we do that in the strength and conditioning world, but you do that in life in general. It's been plenty of times where, you know, things don't go the way I wanted it to go. 
service one. Sometime in the past, and it's not going to be a straight line. So the real, the real opportunities are going to come when you least expect it, and in all, in all aspirations. And for me, you also have to be prepared and ready at all times for those, for those uh, things to occur. I didn't know that I was going to be able to, to work at a gym that allowed me to work with 80 fighters at a time, all in the UFC. But I was ready and capable by, you know, constantly learning and constantly growing. So when I got the opportunity, I was able to take control of that opportunity and take advantage of it to assess. So when you service going out again. Uh, so you're looking, you know, negative sides of can you see me? Can you hear me? The, it went out a little bit because I know you're on the road. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Did I? Where did I leave off on? Uh. You're breaking up, man. <laughs> That's all right. I was, I was on. A, I was on. A, yeah. I was on a roll. <laughs> man, I was on a roll too, bro. I was on a roll. Yeah. You, Adversity. Damn. All right. So I had. To, I'm gonna take my video. All right. So. Yeah. So I mean, at the end of the day, again, I'm looking at it from a. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you're good now. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So whether it be from, you know, things that have to do with where you grew up or where your family or health problems, a lot of times, like I said before, I was able to learn how to pivot and take advantage of certain situations when the time came. So for instance, like I said, I got a job, right, where I was able to work with 60 and 80 plus fighters in a on a constant basis that we're all at the high level. I got that opportunity out of a whim. Now I was able to take advantage of those situations and, the, and that opportunity because I was ready for them. What I mean is that even though you may have the odds stacked against you, quote unquote, you're never at a disadvantage as long as you keep yourself ready at all times for any situation and any opportunity that comes your way. Right. So there's been times, like I said, where I've been facing certain situations that a lot of people can't come out of. A lot of people falter. They stop working to their ultimate goal or stop working for their ultimate goal because of the fact that they feel like it's over. But I never, ever felt like it was over based off of a short term loss. And where a lot of people go wrong is where when they get that short-term loss, they think, oh, well, now it's going to be a trickling down effect. I can't, I can't get out of this rut. I can't get out of the hole. Never, ever felt like that. And you should never feel like that either. You win, a, you win a game, you lose a game. You win a fight, you lose a fight. You keep moving forward no matter what. And in time, God will put you in the right position to be successful no matter what you're doing because every day you're putting yourself ready or getting yourself ready to be in a better position. But if you sit there and have the, you know, woes me type mentality, you're never, ever going to have the stars align appropriate, appropriately for you because we know that you're not ready to take advantage of the opportunity, no matter what's happening. So you guys hear that? Yeah, no, nah, you hear that, bro. You was preaching. All right, bet, 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 yeah. bet. Hey, <laughs> I was trying to take a, take a page out of JK book. I'm taking nah, a page that, out of Hey, book. that was all you, man. Hey. <laughs> real. Time, what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick and choose who has the next ones. So I'm just going to say, question it. I'm going to just call out somebody's name for sake of time, you know. Uh, so next question, it's going to be one, either Rashad or JK. What is the <laughs> advice that you've received that you'll never forget? And I'm going to go with Rashad. What's some advice you've received that you'll never forget? that helped you along your way to keep, always keep back to your, the journey, I guess, adversity that kept you focused. Some advice I received. Or maybe not even advice, even if there's words that you heard, like I have some nah, words. I got you. Hmm? I, got you. Uh, I think it was like my second year or, uh, cause I mean, I, you know, my, my, my path is all over the place. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, uh, I had went JUCO and so like that. I thought football was over and I got kind of a second opportunity. And I told myself if I got another shot, I ain't, I ain't, you know, I'm not letting it go, you know. So I didn't, I stopped partying and doing a lot of stuff that I, that, that took away my shot in the first place and doing some things and hanging out with the wrong people. 
And um, and I just zoned in, man. And then I ended up, you know, getting picked up. But when I got to the league, you know, Mike Wallace gave me some advice because, you know, you get there and you, you, you see the politics and you see, you know, people – you know, they, they are all buddy, buddy with this person, whatever, whatever, playing time, whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. And, um, you know, I wasn't going hard one time on a route or something like that. You know, all of my feelings and stuff, you know, some dumb stuff. And uh, Mike was like, man, hey, bro, I don't care what you do. From now on, you go hard no matter what. You know what I'm saying? He's like, you're too good. You know what I'm saying? You need to be like a tone setter. So he kind of went as, a, as the first person to told me, like, to be a tone setter. I always was one, but. Like, I took it up to another, another level after that. So I'm talking about every time I touched the ball, I don't care if it was special teams. I don't care if I was running down. I don't care if I was getting the ball. If I was on special teams or whatever the case may be, you know, I was just showing out. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was bursting. I was finishing. I was trying to – it doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying? And, and I think when Mike told me to go hard, which I knew that, but I was in my feelings a lot. And Mike was like, hey, bro, you need to go hard no matter what. Like, in this game, and in this NFL, you need to go, you know, you're not guaranteed this, you know, and I think sometimes, you know, us athletes, we get up there and we, we think we're guaranteed a spot and certain things. And um, even though you have that dog eat dog mentality, but sometimes you need some, something to click, you know, um, sometimes you get satisfied, like, oh, I made it, you know, and I, I think I needed that, that type of kick. So uh, Mike told me to go hard no matter what one time. And um, after that, man, my career, you know, it, 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 it went through the roof, but, it was just from just finishing, man, and practice and doing certain things, even training. My training stepped up. I'm talking about, but, you know, I really, like, cut off a lot of people in my life after that because sometimes the people around you might bring you down whether you, you know, you want to admit it or not. But mm-hmm. I was, too, if you weren't for me training in the middle of the night, certain things, I'm sorry, but it was a wrap. And that's what I think. I think it just turned it turned me into a different a different beast. So, uh, my, yeah, Mike, Mike helped me out. Nice. And you said that yeah. was your second year. That was my second year. Um, like I said, I was just I was just cruising on the route, and Mike was like, "Like, what are you doing?" You know, and he was a vet, and I'm like, "Bro, I ain't getting the ball." You know, you know, sometimes those receivers we get all diva ish and whatnot. You know, and uh, you ain't getting the rock and stuff like that. So <laughs> I was like, "I ain't getting it," you know. And then uh, he was like, "Bro, you better go hard." So after that, I went hard. Like I was like, "Fuck it," I mean, forget it, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> Too, I, 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 you know, that's why I tell my players, man, be a tone setter. Whatever you do in life, be a tone setter. You know, don't wait for somebody to show up and stretch or do this or, or, or go hard or whatever. Like, show up and be a tone setter. Get your work in and go home. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a job. Treat it like a job. You know. I guess that um, advice, you do that. I guess that advice worked though, because after that, I know you came one of the leading receivers on the Dolphins and then on the t- the Titans, right? So it definitely you showed it. <laughs> Yeah. I know, off topic, but were you still, like, you started at Tennessee in, what, 2016 or 2017? Yeah, 2016. And J.K., I think so, yeah. You played yeah, at I, I think, I know, I mean, 2016, that's when I, like, really fully moved here, so I know he was there. Uh, that's why I brought it up, because y'all would have been in the same area. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he was there when I was there. I mean, not there, but when I was in Nashville. Oh, oh. Nash- oh you was in Nashville? Yeah. I, li- I live in Antioch, outside of Nashville now. So, okay, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where I, I live at, man. So I'm trying to have my little son now, man. I'm trying to uh, make him a homer um, and, you know, root for the Titans. And, and me and Kevin Byer, we went to, uh, to the same college. We actually wore the same number um, in college. So. Oh, you went to Middle Tennessee? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Were, you th- were you there with Logan? Kill yeah, Boyd? yeah, yeah. Logan was my quarterback uh, my senior year. So Logan was like, I think I had been like Logan, like Rasher, sophomore year, or something like that. Yeah. So he. Um, so when I when I messed up in, so when I messed up in junior college and I got that second opportunity, they sent me to Bakersfield, California. I was living in Texas, like yeah. working at a school library. Like man, you know, is it? You know, and they sent me to Texas. Uh, they sent me to uh, Bakersfield, California, to to go play at Bakersfield College. And Logan was my quarterback. Logan. Okay. Small world, man. <laughs> so yeah, I, right? I see. You know what I'm yeah, I see. He got into coaching too, man. So. Shout out to him, man. Had a good, uh, you know what I'm saying, career over yeah. there in Canada, man, and uh, did good for himself and now I see him coaching. So that's dope, though, man. Yeah. Definitely a small world. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I got a question for JK, but not yet. I'm going to skip ahead back to Phil. Um, advice 
I, I'm pointing this field. I know all y'all have coached before, but I'm pointing this field because I know he's big on uh, the coach-athlete relationship. He even has a big segment on his uh, mentorship, Shameless Pug. If you're a coach out there listening, check out the Drew Strong Mentorship. Uh, but yeah, so Phil, any advice to coaches dealing with their athletes' mental health and personality? Because I know you're big on like how to interact with your with your um, athletes. Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of it comes with uh, communication. You know that, Nick, man. Like we'll we'll sit them down for you know, a good hour and a half before I even start working with them to find out exactly you know what what makes them tick. You know what what drives them, what motivates them. Also, do a Braverman's test. That's that's helped us out a lot um, from a from a written standpoint. Just to just to kind of see exactly what type of person am I dealing with? You know, um, are they, are they a type personality or, you know, are they more dopamine dominant? A lot of my guys usually are, a lot of us are are primarily that type of personality where we're kind of all, you know, all go, um, you know, very, very enthusiastic, want to get after it. So it gives me an understanding of how to actually coach them, but also how to communicate. Then from there, it's just a constant, you know, constant, you know, back and forth, whether it be questions being asked or taking them out to, you know, to a restaurant and really just to kind of get them to get their, let their hair down in a sense. And so that I can uh, see exactly what their background is and what their family, you know, family life's like. And so I can, again, coach them, but also get them to a point to where they trust in me and trust in the program. And that's really going to help us, you know, from, from an overall perspective of, of like, all right, now we know that this guy is caring about me and what I need. And from there, they're going to be more apt to doing the program and following along to what you tell them because they actually know that you care about them. That buy-in. Yeah, that's big. Yeah. Cause if they don't trust you, they ain't going to, I don't care how renowned you are. And I've seen it like you earn their trust. And I've seen coaches the opposite. They think their credentials is going to get the athlete. And I'm sure JK and Shark, from that standpoint, I'm sure you got guys, you looked at them like, please, all because you got a, a oh. master's in strength conditioning or you think I'm going to train with you just because of that. So and obviously, Man, I didn't care who you were. Hey, I don't care who you are. You got to, you know, you got to treat me like you would treat your kid, man. If you, you know what I'm saying? Talk to me like an adult, you know, talk to me like a human being. That's the biggest thing. That's why I like what he said, man, you know, is pouring into like showing that you care. You know, you show you show somebody you care, though, they'll give you their all, you know, because, they, you know, we, we know we know if somebody cares or not. And uh, you show you you you, you know, you cross off that, you know, um, the, the, the possibilities are endless. That's that. Um. The question I want to say for you, JK, because obviously all three of y'all are dealing with life beyond sport, field, successful training business. Rashar has been doing some great things with the community, coaching at um, West Broward. He's helped me out with my business. But JK, I specifically want to ask you this because I know, like given what you said earlier about your journey from top level uh, college to arena aspirations for the NFL, which obviously – Granted, you won numerous championships with the Rattlers, defensive back of the year. So you definitely, I, I like to say I'm biased, but I definitely feel you earn your place. But life beyond sport, I'm asking you specifically because I know you created uh, We Impact Now. Uh, I know you do motivational speaking. I know you're big in the Nashville community. So I want to hear your take on dealing with life after football. Uh, well, I, I seen Amos' question too, so it was it's like kind of like twofold because I think he asked like, uh, well, I didn't see it. Um, how did I uh, deal with not making it to the league? You know, how did I accept something that's not going to happen, right? Um, and one thing I had to realize that um, some like I don't have closure about my professional football career. I'm thankful, satisfied, you know. what I'm saying I have no regrets. But I don't have closure. I thought it was going to end a little differently. And it definitely ended abruptly with the league kind of folding and all that. Um, so I had to realize that uh, in life, sometimes we just don't have closure and we still got to keep going. Um, and so that was one thing that I had to really realize. And then um, another thing, I remember when I uh, first came out of MT, I was playing in the UFL with the Omaha Nighthawks. I probably was training with you at the time, I think, um, but with the Omaha Nighthawks. And I remember... I was like, at the practice, we walking one day and I was like, man, this is all we got to do. Like go to practice, no school. And, th- you know, and one of the dude, he played like five years in the league for the Lions. And he was like, he was like, this is nice, ain't it? I was like, yeah. He was like, but let me tell you this. He was like, focus, enjoy playing while you're playing. But while you're playing, think about what you want to do after football. Don't wait until you retire 
it was like think about you know what you want to do while you're playing and that that mindset like stuck with me and so that's what I tell the you know the players I coach now and stuff like that is like hey like go all in with football or whatever sport you play but start to think about especially now in 2021 you got so many entrepreneurs xyz like you could be pursuing sports but also be working on a business or doing xyz um and so i had to realize also man just in my walk with god like him you know spending time with him him talking to me um just understanding that i wasn't what i did like i wasn't football football is just what i did right so i had to understand like because of who i am that's why i played football so the moment that i wasn't playing football i didn't stop being jeremy i just stopped doing football now, because of who I am, I go around speaking. I do X, Y, Z. And I think, and I know in the beginning when I was kind of out, you had like the whole athletic identity, right? Because I think when we're younger, as kids, we start playing sports when we're younger, but we're also learning who we are as people. So we're learning our identity. And while we're learning our identity as people, we have sports. So that gets intertwined. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, am I a football player? Am I Jeremy Kellum? Am I both? Who I, and then, you know, once you get older and you're like, okay, I don't have any football anymore. Who am I? And so that's kind of the transition. And so like that dude said, hey, think about what you want to do. So while I was playing arena, I was doing part-time jobs as a youth development professional, going back at the Boys and Girls Club in Florida um, and then in Tennessee. And I was working. So the moment I stopped playing football, boom, I was able to transition into a director role. All because while I was playing, I was doing part-time, 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 building relationships, and then I was able to transition. So um, that was kind of like my mentality, and I try to share that with athletes. It's like, look, man, like, you you are more than that sport you play. You know what I'm saying? That's just what you do. That's not who you are. And then I try to get them to think about other interests and talents and gifts that they have that they can tap into while playing as well. But, uh, but yeah, that's kind of like my transition with the life beyond sport, though. Yeah, that's why I'm glad you said that with the um, athletic identity because that just brings back, like I say, I'm the book knowledge, but that just shows you people that's real deal because I, I think it was Brett Favre, I saw a few years ago, had a tweet that said an athlete dies twice. So when I saw that, I was like, well, I got to get ready for that first funeral because obviously we have our real death, yeah, but yeah. the athletic death, most of us are 23, 27. Yeah. When you look, I know Phil, Rashard, JK, you're probably all late to this. I remember as a JIT, like, we would, we would be like, Dang, he old. And it's like, let's say uh, Mike Vick, right? Then he yeah. old. Mike Vick is only like eight years older than us. Yeah. <laughs> so LeBron, like, LeBron, like, really in our age group, bro. You feel me? So we looked at yeah. these athletes as these old guys, like Randy Moss retired at like 34, yeah. 35. And it's like, that's where we at now. <laughs> and yeah. like, I feel like we got so much room to grow. So we tell these young kids, we all work with kids. We all got kids, too. I think all our kids are about close to the same age. It's like, we, we, we where they were, but yet we have so much life left. So the athletic identity, like you said, you got to know. So coaches, obviously you got to push your athletes. You got to make sure they're ready for the sport. But we have a responsibility because all of us coach, all of us work with uh, athletes, youth to pro. You got to be able to get them mentally ready for the real world. Like Phil said earlier, everything you should do should align with the life goals, you know? Yeah. But, right. um. Uh, I guess well, uh, it's uh, if anyone out there will wrap up with a Q and A. I know Miles asked a question; you kind of answered it. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, write it in the chat. You, like I said, Rashard, J.K., and Phil collectively. That's if you take their athletic careers, that's like thirty years of experience. If you take their lives, that's ninety years of experience. So, have at it. Like anyone who out there, this is your chance to get some solicited advice that you usually don't get for free. <laughs> I know uh, I'm in this other part of the question I didn't. He, uh, Amos said, how did I come to uh, grip with it? Um, I had did uh, like a Taco Thursday on it, man. And um, like, you got to let go of ideal, like ideal, you know what I'm saying? Like an ideal image or an ideal vacation type thing. Like kind of what, what Phil was talking about, how you think like your life is going to go this way or it's going to go that way. And we all have like that ideal, you know what I'm saying, image or that ideal career, how it's gonna go. Like I literally had to like let go of ideal. And that's what I was holding on to, like why I really wasn't appreciating arena at first. Cause I'm like, man, this ain't what I wanted. Like, and nah, like I'm trying to get to the league. And that was my mindset, but I never really appreciated it until like my third year. And I was like, you know what? This is what God 
God for me. You know what I'm saying? This is why I'm at. And I heard T.D. Jake say this. He was like, man, he was like, be great on your level. And so we all, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, you look at whether a pastor, some pa pastors are mega churches, some storefront, some make it to the league, some make it to Canada, AFL, whatever level you on, you just got to strive to be the, the, the best on that level. And that was kind of like my mentality and like how I came to grip with it. And, and for the longest, man, I wouldn't tell people I retired. I was like, yeah, man, you know, because Arena, you could come back like any time. I had, oh, I'm talking about not old, like we say, but I'm talking late 30s. Some people maybe pinching 40, you know. But, uh, yeah, man, I think I'm starting to, like, use that more now. Like, man, yeah, you know, when I played, I'm done playing now. Um, but it took time to get to that mindset. But, I, you know, saying at the end of the day, I had to let go of ideal and just realize and be thankful for the career. Because, like you said, you know, I know people that didn't play out the high school or didn't play out the college or or whatever the case may be. Um, so we all been blessed um, to make it to the levels that we made it to. So I think like, you know what I'm saying? It'll be selfish of me to, to complain about that. Nice. Um, I think also the, to piggyback off that, Jay, man, is that if you break it down, right? Cause I went to Alabama State, left, had to leave there, uh, had concussions, a series of concussions, had to stop you know, fighting as a professional. So there's a lot of things that like, okay, I wanted to go to the league. I wanted to go to the UFC. All that stuff got taken away. You know what I mean? But if you really break it down, our ultimate goal in life is to be happy and to be fulfilled. Yeah. So no matter what you're doing, if it's something that's filling a void that you enjoy, that you know that you're, you know, creating happiness with other indiv under individuals and you're... I guess, staking your claim in this world and you're able to help other people too as well, then you're actually doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? And I'm looking at it from like a virtue standpoint. And for me, no matter what I tend, intend on doing, whether it be coaching athletes, whether it be running businesses, whether it be mentoring other coaches and also being a father and a husband, the goal is to be the best that I can be so that everyone around me, including myself, is happy and we have nothing to worry about when the time comes to meet, you know, the one and only. Yeah, that's real, bro. I just learned something. I, I didn't even know that, that part of your story, man, on why you uh, you weren't fighting, bro. So that's- Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's real, yeah, bro. Man, listen, you. we all know, we all have had concussions. Yeah. <laughs> and it's crazy that I'll say that because you know, I just finished probably, what, two, three years ago, and I think maybe within, you know, this last year, year-ish, you know, uh, like the admitting of depression and certain things started, like, falling in, like, you know, and and it's like, yeah, you know, I played, and you know, but the way I left was kind of, you know, whatever, and sometimes, man, it's like you said, you know, you guys said it, it's appreciating where you are. You know, and I think, you know, sometimes we don't do that enough in life. We want so we want so much and we, we're so caught up in the bullsh, you know, the BS that we don't just sit down and, and, and look around and see what we're thankful of. You know, see, you know, family, you know, we all got families and certain things. And I think obviously you want goals and things like that. But, you know, um, you know, I've been I've been in this past year just kind of figuring life out, man, because it's, it's tough. You know, uh, that depression ain't no joke. And um, like I said, the biggest part is admitting it and trying to figure out how to get past it. And, um, you know, it, it's funny you guys said, like, the, you died twice, you know. Um, so I guess in this afterlife, I'm still figuring it out. I'm j I just began this afterlife, and it's not easy, you know. And, uh, I, you know, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's hard to kind of explain, but y'all know what I mean. It's just more so, um, I think I'm more at the realization of appreciating just the fact that I'm a father and things like that. It, it, you know, I, I think that when you, you want to do so much, it's like, you know, it's like you said earlier, man, not everybody got to even play at our level that we played at or done the things that we've done or still doing the things that we do. And other, you know, we all got homeboys that are doing stuff that whatever the case may be, you know, they, they would easily want to switch places or whatever but it's just appreciating the now you know what i'm saying and uh i think i think by doing that it it uh puts everything else kind of at ease i guess for a little bit you know <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, yeah, with me, that I'm I'm figuring that out now. It's yeah, it's tough, but we got to do it. Nah, no, that's real. So Phil had lost reception because he's like I said he was on the road. He's deep in the Key West now. So he said he just texted me, apologized, but thanks for everyone having him on. We appreciate him. So we'll wrap it up. We got two more questions. And we'll wrap it up because I know you guys got a lot of things to do for your day and the weekend with your family. So Romeo said, "How do you guys deal with failure, and how has it changed over the years?" So, yeah, uh, anyone? Because I know we talked about stress, but I don't think we yeah. went deep into failure per se. I know I try to make it as quick as possible, man. Um, so that's I thought on that third question that was my question that was next. I thought so I was like prepping myself, but man, you know, for me, I think I, I deal with failure better now, or my perspective of looking at it. Um, Man, I, I I didn't do good with with, with failure uh, coming out of high school. Um, I don't even think you know this, Nick, but um, I you know I had a tra- chance to train with uh, Pat Peterson and his dad and stuff like that uh, in college, right? Because uh, yeah, I did, right? So I won't get into like the family connections in that, but basically, I went to church where his uh, his auntie and grandma went, right? So make a long story short. Uh, my pastor was like, hey, you know, Pat don't want to, you know, Big Pat want to train, you know, want to train you. I was in college at MT. And I'm like, nah, I'm good. I'm training by myself, right? Why did I say that? Because the 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 fear of failing in front of them, right? It wasn't even like the fear of failing. It was the fear of failing in front of them, like him, um, other NFL players. He was in college at this time. So I'm like, man, what? Like LSU, like this man about to win the Thorpe Award, X, Y, Z, right? And so... I let that stop me from taking advantage of the opportunity. Um, and then as I matured and I realized and I got another opportunity to train with them, which he was there, um, I ran and took advantage of it. And I just had to look at it and, and not look at failure as something negative or just look at it as a challenge and understand that if I go and attack this obstacle, um, I get stronger. Even if I fail, I'm still gonna get better. And my confidence after training with Pat I was training with a honey badger. And even I hold on to what you told me in the car about what Dion said. He was like, hey, that dude could plan the lead. Start right now at safety. I'm like, I hold on to that. Even if, you know what I'm saying? I didn't make it, but I hold on to that. But what I, my point and what I'm saying is I had to change my perspective of how I looked at failure. And even now as an adult, it's like, you know, I'm like, okay, like I need a challenge. I want a challenge. A challenge doesn't always feel good. You know what I'm saying? But like y'all were talking about, uh, like Rashad was talking about, but I know that after going through that challenge, nine times out of 10, I'm going to be better. Um, so I think it's about how we look at failure um, and the perspective of how we look at it. Um, if we think that failure means that it's the end, then we probably won't try that thing again. But if we look at failure as being something that can, um, like water, that can help us grow, if it, it, you know, going through that and being poured on or experiencing failure, you're going to grow from it, then I think that we'll be more apt to taking that challenge. So that's how I had to change the way I looked at failure. That gives, like, I ain't gonna lie. It's cold in this room, but that gave me chills only because like I said, Miles can attest to this too. He's still on here. I'll give uh, Rashard his question because I think, even though obviously you have a family now, but Rashard having it during his career, I'll let him answer that question. But the reason I said I got chills is because knowing you, all state, I watched you literally lead our, our touchdown leader. I remember senior year <laughs> as yeah. a safety. So yeah. it's like, like, Hearing that, because I always knew you were a human being. It's not like I put you on a pedestal, but I did put you higher than me because, you know, me, I didn't play football till freshman year. So I was always a step behind in the learning. Obviously, I was very athletic, but I, my IQ, like looking back, my IQ wasn't there for football, you know? Yeah. But I was just a good athlete. So it helped me at least stay in the mix. But knowing that about you and hear you say that was like, boom, because I would have never thought that, you yeah. know, because you were what all... uh What's your conference at uh, Middle Tennessee? Uh, Sun Belt. Uh, first Sun Belt, all Sun Belt. Yeah. Uh, freshman, weren't you freshman All American or something like that? Or second time? Uh, well, I was, they had like a, nah, I didn't make freshman All American, but, I, don't know but I made like, I was in line, like Coach Diaz, that's the head coach at uh, University of Miami. He was my D coordinator. So he told my mom, like, the pace that I was on my freshman year. He told her, don't tell Jeremy this. Hey, she, he was like, Coach Diaz was like, the pace he's on right now, he can be freshman All American. Guess what she did? Told me. Not saying that that messed me up, you feel me? But, bro, when you talking about I was in my own newspaper clippings, not in an arrogant way, like I'm walking around cocky, but in a way that I was like, when I read it, it kind of filled me. You know what I'm saying? Took away that hunger. And, you know what I'm saying? I had to learn from my freshman year. 
Um, but uh, but yeah, man, it's just like to your point, man. That's what I had to realize. Like, it's all we all got mental health, right? We all got to cater. We all dealing with LeBron. This man dealing with thoughts. You feel me? Every day, if, especially if he turned on like ESPN, FS1, all the, they talk about him, everything he do. So it's like he's human too. And that's what I had to realize. Like, what I'm feeling is because I'm human, not because I'm not good enough, not because I'm not talented. It's because I'm human. But the difference between the great or the people that succeed, like y'all talked about, is the ones that can push through those feelings and being able to go execute and do whatever it is that you um, are striving to do. But uh, but definitely, though, bro. Nice. So this last question, we'll finish with this. My boy, Miles Amos, appreciate you tuning in and everyone else watching. I'll give it to Richard because he was still playing. When I met him, he was still playing. He had, uh, at that time, two children. So I think this would be a good question for you. How do you balance family and having a pro career? Um, Miles is currently, give you some background on him, he's currently a professional MMA. Uh, we, me and JK went to school with him. He was a standout lineman with us, but now he does MMA and he's won championships and he's building up the level to get to the, obviously the highest level. So he wants to know, how do you deal with having that work of the training, the actual competition and dealing with your family? Uh, the biggest thing is, is your, your partner. You know, um, is being on the same page at all times, you know, uh, making sure they understand what it is that you're going through, not being afraid to explain. Sometimes we just in and out. Hey, I got to go train. All right, cool. I need to eat. I need to do this and I'm out. You know, it, it's uh, being able to take that time to, uh, you know, communicate with them. You know, what's going what, What's your thoughts? What's going on? What are you stressing about? Maybe they can help you out. Certain things like that. Um my wife comes kind of from a, a, a sports world in a sense and, and her parents, you know, kind of run a business so that she understands like the hours, but um, we both knew what was at stake as far as like, you know, uh, it takes a lot of concentration and, and certain things, but the biggest thing, like I said, is talking to, talking to your, your significant other every night, figuring it out, spending time with the kids whether it's uh, whether it's them watching you train, them coming to train with you, run with you, whatever, exercise, anytime is any, even I would come home and even fall asleep on the floor. I didn't care because as long as they saw me, daddy would sleep right there. They see they still see me. You know what I'm saying? And that that was to me, that was better than anything as far as like, you know, anytime. Like as long as they see me, that's all that matters, in my opinion. Um, but the biggest thing is, is being on the same page with your significant other or your or your family. You know, and, and talking to your kids, you know, um, we talk to our kids like adults. You know, if I have to go train, hey, daddy got to go train right now. I'll be back. Whatever, whatever, whatever age group they are, they know. They see you leave and they see you come back. So the biggest thing is being on the same page. So then eventually your kids are like, oh, you leaving? And they'll start packing your bags for you, doing certain things. Um, but that's what it was like for me. And, we, you know, we had to travel and things like that. But it's constant the FaceTimes in the morning or if you can't make it or the, the calls, the text messages, even if you don't want to, you've got to communicate. You've got to do all those things, you know, um, cause if, if y'all on the same page, nothing could be broken, you know? And that's, um, I think what helped me out. Uh, it was tough though, because I mean, I think I told you this one time, one time I came home and my daughter, my daughter cried when I walked through the door. Cause you know, I, I came back, I think from Nashville or something and she started crying cause she didn't know who I was. Yep. And, you know, I tell people the sacrifice that you got to, you know, that has to be done. And, and I was gone so much that she didn't know who I was. She started crying when I came to give her a hug because she didn't know me, you know, and uh, I think she was like almost two at this time. So, you know, it, it's, but you got to be, you know, we got to be strong mentally to, to get past all those things. And, uh, but the biggest thing is communication and talking to people that are in the same, uh, I guess the same boat as you and things like that. Cause maybe they can give you advice or doing, you know, things like this and, um, you know, not being afraid to be open. You know, I think with athletes, um, it's like I said in the beginning, we're too afraid to be open and uh, tell people what's really on our mind or what's going on because somebody might have the solution, man. They might say something that you might be like, oh, man, I like that, you know. And But if, if they don't know what's in your mind, you can't get the solution, you know, or you can't get the possibility of a solution. So, um, yeah, that's how, that's, how, that's how we worked it out. It wasn't easy. It's not easy. Not, none of it's easy. Uh, if it was easy, you know, they say if it, everything you do, if it was easy, everybody would do it. You know, uh, it was not easy. It's not easy watching your daughter cry because she don't know you, you know, um, and then having to go train the next day type. You know, it's not easy or having to leave, 
you know, two days to go back and, and you know, go, you know, do what you got to do. But uh, it's not easy, but you got to do it, you know. Somebody has to do it. That's real. That's real. Great stuff, guys. So we'll wrap it up. I guess say, where do they find you? Anyone at home, plug yourself. Yeah, I'm uh, uh, Richard Matthews on Instagram. R-I-S-H-A-R-D-M-A-T-T-H-E-W-S. Um, I'm on, on Instagram. So, yeah, follow your boy there. I got my, my youngins coming up. So, trying to, you know, make him carry the torch now. So, uh, follow, like, all that stuff. Subscribe. Nah, I ain't got no YouTube or nothing. But, uh, you know what I mean? Just show some love and appreciate everything. Most deaf, most deaf. Yo, on Instagram, uh, they can follow me at JK underscore impacts, um, JK underscore impacts. Uh, then I'm on Twitter under the same thing, JK underscore impacts. Um, as far as uh, I do have uh, a YouTube, so you put Jeremy Kellum um, slash win, Pat now slash win. Um, so uh, those are things that they can follow me. And then every Thursday, man, they can hop on my IG live or Facebook. Um, and, and tune in to Tackle Thursday with JK Mama podcast. So uh, those are some things that they can follow and keep up with me. Yeah. So hey, maybe Rashard, if y'all could collaborate, I'm sure y'all can make some good moves. Two football guys. And I, side note, I'd love to see if you ever get back in the Florida area, y'all go head to head. Because I knew that I was coming. I knew that I was. Coming. I joked yeah, about yeah, it, but you already knew. I'm, I'm a scrub now. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. Hey. You too, though. I would like to see that. I, I would put money on that. Hey, night, hey, I, night, I, got two, few, night. I got a few routes left in me. I got, I got a few, few routes. Route. I'm gonna have to. Mate. I'm gonna have to do. I'm gonna have to do some stretching. And uh, you know, when you kind of <laughs> when you said when you said uh, you 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 was like you trying to stay in shape, man. I ain't even gonna lie, man. Like mentally, because I felt like I gave it everything I got. You know what I'm saying when I was playing. So now it's like, I feel like I'm drained. And so I'm trying to like stay in shape. Now I take the kids outside. So I'm like using that as cardio, you know what I mean? But, but like when I be out there and I do like one serious little move, I'm like, hold on, feel a little tug yeah. on the hand, means the little groin. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, no, I, I got to really train before I get out there, you know? And I, and I got friends that play like semi-pro and other leagues. I'm like, bro, y'all don't get out and flat. I'm like, y'all don't get out there and stretch. They're like, nah, bro, we don't do no stretch. I said, yeah. no way, I got to do a dynamic warm up. Before I get out there and play, man. But yeah, man, I need, to, I, that, I, though, man. I, need to, I need to show up at least thirty minutes before. Hit yeah. me a little, you know. Have hit me a little, little warm up. up. The worst thing is, man, when you got the kids, you be eating all their food. That's that's yeah. my problem. <laughs> Everything I be tearing it up. They be hey. mad. They, they snacks be so good, but and then finding a group of a group of people who want to be, you know, uh, physically fit like you, but it's hard because ain't nobody trying to train like we used to train. You know. Yeah, not nah, definitely. And it, definitely. It's yeah. tough. So, uh, you know, that's that's my biggest thing. And then, I mean, it's so easy to be like, no, nah, I'm going to do it tomorrow. And then Man, I'm going to yeah, get after it tomorrow. <laughs> hey, tomorrow, hey, tomorrow, tomorrow uh, turn into like a month. Then I'm like, oh, man, I got to get back at it, man. You know? <laughs> yeah. Man, tomorrow, I'm on, my tomorrow, I'm on uh, year two. My tomorrow hey. about to be. <laughs> hey, I feel you, though. And the crazy thing, it's not that, oh, we out of, like, we're insanely out of shape. But you know, yeah, like yeah. where you were, like you know what I'm saying. So like, it's like, okay, I'm not bad compared to, but you know, I'm competing against myself. So it's like, I, I could do better than this. A little, you know, what I'm saying, I definitely could do a little better than this. But uh, but yeah, man, we're gonna, gonna have to definitely, uh, you know, what I'm saying, link up, man, get some training in though. Definitely, definitely, I'm with it, man. Yeah, most definitely. All right, appreciate folks. this, Nick, man. Hey, appreciate it, bro. And the thing, I was just, hey, I was telling Brittany, I was like, I was just trying to show some love. And tell them to go check out my dog. And he's like, hey, just come on. I'm like, all right, bro. But yeah, man, you know what I'm saying? I appreciate this opportunity too, man. Yeah, originally it was just going to be me going over the slides. And I'm like, no, what? Yeah. So when you said it, I hit up Rashad and Phil. And um, I was like, F it. Y'all y'all all got good info. <laughs> y'all got platforms. So yeah. like I said, people think I'm joking. When I share this on my page, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, this is great info. I'm like, well, you should have been there for the live, but luckily I recorded. So yeah, yeah. cut it up, maybe send some clips to everybody, that would be what, some key phrase, because a lot there was a lot of key, what they call them, gems, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, you know that, <laughs> that, that that's that, uh, that, uh, that, that um, social media terms, like dropping gems or yeah. bars, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Dropping bars, I know I'd be using that. But, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, man, this is great though.
Thank you guys. Yeah. Have a good rest of your nights. And yeah, get your mind right.